Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty 3. My magical mystery tour ground to a halt in a West Los Angeles neighborhood the locals call Hillside. Shaped like a giant cul-de-sac, Hillside is less a community than a quarry of stucco homes built directly into the foothills of the San Borachos Mountains. Unlike most California communities that border mountain ranges, Hillside has no gentle slopes upon which children climb trees and overly friendly park rangers lead weekend flora and fauna tours. In the late 1960s, after the bloody but little known I'm tired of the white man fucking with us and whatnot riots, the city decided to pave over the neighboring mountainside, surrounding the community with a great concrete wall that spans its entire curved perimeter save for an arched gateway at the southwest entrance. At the summit of this cement precipice wealthy families live in an upper middle class hamlet known as Cheviot Heights. At the bottom of this great wall live hordes of impoverished American Mongols. Hard rock niggers, Latinos, and Asians, who because of the wall's immenseness get only 15 minutes of precious sunshine in summer and a burst of solstice sunlight in the winter. If it weren't always so hot it would be like living in a refrigerator. We lived in a Pueblo-style home with a cracked and fissuring plaster exterior my mother said provided an old Mexico flavor. Even she had to laugh when I walked up to a peeling section of the house, broke off a yellow paint chip, popped it into my mouth, rubbed my tummy, and said, mmm, nacho cheese. Our backyard nestled right up against the infamous wall. I often marveled at the unique photosynthesis that allowed the fig, peach, and lemon trees to thrive in a dim climate where it often rained dead cats and dogs, rotted fish, and droplets of piss. Apparently rich folks have an acerbic sense of humor. After a week in our new home, a black and white welcome wagon pulled up in front of the house to help the newcomers settle into the neighborhood. Two mustachioed officers got out of the patrol car and knocked on our front door with well-practiced leather-gloved authority. Tossing courtesy smiles at my mother, the cops shouldered their way past the threshold and presented her with a pamphlet entitled, How to Report Crime and Suspicious Activity Whether the Suspects Are Related to You or Not. It wasn't the day-old macaroni casserole she'd been expecting. My sisters and I sat in the living room, half listening to the news on the radio, half listening to the cops asking mama questions to which they already knew the answers. Kids, Miss Kaufman? Yes, three. Two girls, ten and eleven, and a boy, thirteen, all of them left-handed, right? That's correct. Ma'am. May we speak to the boy, Gunner? My mother turned around and waved me over with the hated come hither crooked index finger. I lifted my sheepish carcass off the couch and shuffled like a reluctant butler toward the interrogation. The cop with gold stripes on his sleeves cut Mama a look and said, Alone, Ms. Kaufman, and she deserted me with a satisfied smirk, happy that I was finally getting a bitter taste of her vaunted, traditional black experience. I stood there, perched directly under the door jam, as I'd learned to do when your earth quaked. My slumping shoulders trembled. My kneecaps shook. These weren't some Santa Monica cops sporting conflict resolution ribbons, riding powder blue bicycles, this was the LAPD, dressed to oppress, their hands calmly poised over open holsters like seasoned gunfighters. I tried to distance myself from the rumbling in my ears, clamoring for one of those out-of-body experiences only white folks in midlife crises seem to have. I felt the gases rising from my queasy stomach to inflate my body. My arms and legs began to swell, and slowly I began to float away. I was just getting off the ground when I let out a long silent fart. Apparently, my escape fantasy had a slow leak. Son, you smell something? Nope. Well, something reeks. Oh, that's the chitlins. My would-be out-of-body experience hovered there, wafting in the flatulent fumes. I wasn't going anywhere, I felt like a Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade balloon, tethered, 
and grounded to reality by fishing lines looped through my nose and eyeballs. I was a helium distraction until the arrival of Santa Claus. Look, Daddy, Snoopy with an afro. The squat grayish blonde officer removed his cap and introduced himself and his partner as officers Frank Russo and Neil Salty. Gooner, we know you had some problems with the Santa Monica Police Department. Son, herein, the officer took a deep breath, Nuestra Senora La Reina de Los Angeles de Porciuncula, we practice what we like to call, preventative police enforcement. Whereby, we prefer to deter habitual criminals before they cause irreparable damage to the citizenry and or its property. You mean you put people who haven't done anything in the back seat of your squad car and beat the shit out of them so you don't have to do any paperwork. Thereby preventing any probable felonious assaults on the citizenry. And or its property. And or it is. You know, my father is a sketch artist down at Wilshire Division. Does that carry any weight? Yeah, he gets to visit your ass in jail without being strip-searched. Taking out a small notebook from his supercop utility belt, he continued the inquest. What's your gang affiliation? Gang affiliation? Who do you run with? Who are your crimies, your homies, your posse? You know, yo, niggers. Oh, I see. Well, on weekends I'm down with the gang of four. Who? To his partner, geez, these fucking turds are incredible, there's a new gang every frigging week. Then he turned back to me. So, Gunnar, who you banging within this gang of four? You know, it's me, my homegirl Jiang Qing, Wang Hongwen, Zhang Chu Chiao, and my nigger even if he don't get no bigger ya when you on. Shit, we run in thangs from Shanghai to Compton. Although I had only lived in Hillside for a few days, it was impossible not to pick up a few local catchphrases while running errands for mother. Language was everywhere. Smoldering embers of charcoal etymology so permeated the air that whenever someone opened his mouth it smelled like smoke. Double-check the mailbox to see if your letters had fallen through and the lid shrieked, dumbass motherfucker, have you ever looked and letters were still there? No. Shut the goddamn lid. Press the crossing button at the intersection and the signal blinked a furious, hurry the fuck up. Call information and the operator answered the phone with a throaty, who dis? Nothing infuriated my mother more than me lounging on one elbow at the dinner table slinging my introductory slang with a mouth full of mashed potatoes, she it, ma, I'm running thangs, fuck the dumb. Seriously, son, judging by your previous nefarious history, we feel that you have a proclivity for gang activity. Do us all a favor and come clean. Okay, fuck the dumb. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and odd-numbered Fridays when my mother lets me stay out late, I be down with the Our Gang He-Man Woman Haters Club. Matter of fact, we have a rumble with the Bowery Boys next week. If you see that schmuck mugs, tell the bum I'm gonna kick his ass. Okay, we're going to put you down as unaffiliated. For now keep your big black nose clean. Gang affiliation? I didn't even have any friends yet. My sisters and I had no idea how to navigate our way around this hardscrabble dystopia. Each of us had already been beaten up at least once just for trying to make friends. Deciding there was safety in numbers, we took to traveling in a pack. Nervously, traipsing through the minefield, we tiptoed past the suspected ruffians and kept on the lookout for snipers. Shots would ring out from nowhere, forcing us into sacrificial heroics, diving onto verbal grenades to save the others. Say, bitch ass, Khmer. Who, me? Must be you, you looked. You guys, go on without me. Get away while there's still time. Tell mama I love her. I regret that I have only one life to give for my family. By day six of the ghetto hostage crisis my sibling captives and I were avoiding the dangers of the unexplored territory along the banks of the harbor freeway by sitting in the den playing minutiae pursuance, substituting our own questions for the inane ones on the cards. Sports and leisure, 
for the pie. Oh, this one's a toughie. How many dimples on a golf ball? 463. Give me my peace. Mom was not the kind of matriarch to let her brood hide up under her skirt, clutching her knees, sheltered from the mean old negroes outside. Under the guise that she was worried about our deteriorating social skills, she suggested we go to Rainier Park and play with the other kids in the neighborhood. She might as well have told us to play in the prison yard at Attica. Rainier Park was an overgrown inner-city rainforest that some Brazilian lumber company needed to uproot. You needed a machete to clear a path to the playground. The sandbox was an uninhabitable breeding ground for tetanus and typhus. Shards of broken glass and spent bullet shells outnumbered grains of sand by a ratio of four to one. Hypodermic needles nosed through this shimmering sinkhole like rusted punji sticks. Despite our pleas for a pardon, Mom invoked the death penalty and sentenced us to an afternoon at the park. For the record, the condemned ate last meals of liverwurst and mustard on white bread and drank grape Kool-Aid, extra scoop of sugar, before departing. We were somberly alternating turns on the only working swing when two girls about ten years old, smoking cigarettes and sharing sips from a canned piña colada, approached us. The taller of the two was wearing denim overalls and had so many pink and blue barrettes clipped to the thinning patches of braided hair on her head it looked as though she was under attack by a swarm of plastic moths. The other girl had on orange polyester hot pants and a matching polka dot halter top that was so small it barely succeeded in halting her two BB-sized nipples. Her hair was heavily greased into a rigid elliptical disc that sat precariously on the crown of her head. Every few seconds she'd stoop down to pick up a discarded needle and deposit it in her little red naugahyde purse. She resembled a Vietnamese woman wearing a straw hat and toiling in a paddy. I listened for bleeding water buffalo but heard only the bigger one's mouth. Get out of our swing now, she shouted at Nicole. Nicole wanted to get off the swing, but she was catatonic with fear. It didn't help that out of sheer nervousness Christina and I kept pushing, propelling her stiff frame higher and faster. Kicking off their dime store flip-flops, the two badly coiffed bullies marched through the sandbox without a flinch or grimace. A little diaper, clad boy waddled up, blew a kazoo tribunal, and heralded the dyspeptic duo, that my sister Foz Betty and her bestest friend Vampa nigger on the regular Veronica. They fixin' to kick y'all sass. Betty and Veronica went into a loud hands-on hips, call and response, head-bobbing tirade on how they owned the entire park from the calcified jungle gym to the busted teeter-totter. Betty's braids stood on end as she demanded that Nicole get off the swing before she heated up every piece of broken glass in the sandbox, affixed them to the end of one of those pointy 7-Eleven slurpy straws, and blew glass bubbles in her tight black bourgeois booty. The thought of this snake-haired demon shoving molten glass in her rectum gorgonized Nicole even further. Her sphincter tightened and her rock-hard butt sat heavy in the swing. Betty picked up a piece of broken glass, lit a bic lighter, and teasingly passed the piece of glass through the flame, her fireproof fingers impervious to the heat. Nicole's hands fastened themselves to the chains, her legs spread out in front of her and locked at the knees. Mistaking our silent petrification for hinkty insolence, Betty and Veronica tried to rush us. The alcohol must have affected their bullying judgments, because they charged into Nicole Chin first just as her legs were in the high kicking upstroke of a swing filled with panic-stricken kinetics. Foz Betty caught a sneaker in the trachea and Veronica Vamp a nigger something or the other got kicked in the solar plexus. Wiggling in spasmodic waves like dying fish on the filthy playground, the girl somehow managed to find enough air to moan raspy Miles Davis, motherfuckers, and threats that every ex-con cousin, pyromaniac auntie, serial killer uncle, and pit bull in the neighborhood would soon be coming to put that head out and peel our caps. Within moments, as if some silent gangster medical alert alarm had gone off, a small army of nepotistic enforcers magically appeared at the entrance near the basketball courts, parting the underbrush and yelling, y'all fucking with my cousins? 
the three of us instantaneously burst into a waterfall of tears. Begging for a sympathetic detente, Christina and I mindlessly continued to push Nicole's swing. Her whooshing arc through the air, accompanied by the rusty swing set's rhythmic creak, became a foreboding, metronomic pendulum counting down our deaths. We didn't know. We didn't know. Please leave us alone. A screaming vortex of punches and kicks answered our pleas with a firm ignorantia juris nemenem excusat. The ghetto intelligentsia had kindly provided the young Kaufmans with our first lesson in street smartology, never, ever cry in public, it only makes it worse. If we hadn't bawled we might have been let off with a polite cursory thrashing, just to maintain protective appearances. Since we sobbed like wailing refugee babies, we received a full-scale beatdown designed to toughen us up for the inevitable cataclysmic Italian opera ending of black tragedy. Usually when the fat lady sings in a black community, it's at a funeral. I've seen kids get hit by cars, ice cream trucks, bullets, billy clubs, and not even whimper. The only time it's permissible to cry is when you miss the lottery by one number or someone close to you passes away. Then you can cry once, but only once. There is no brooding, niggers got to get up and go to work tomorrow. My sisters and I walked home routed, picking bits of gravel out of one another's tattered afros and holding our heads back to stanch our nosebleeds. I thought about Betty's fleck bouffant, Veronica's flying, saucer-like dew, and the oily jerry curls, rock-hard pomade cold waves, and horsehair weaves of our attackers, and I realized that every day for the black American is a bad hair day. We haven't seen daddy since we moved. Mommy told me he knows where we live, but he won't come by. Fuck that nigger. Listen to you. So, tough guy, I think Betty and Veronica kind of like you. Did you notice the tender look in their eyes when they stomped on your head? Which one you gonna choose, Archaeakins? Oh, be quiet. I could swear that little baby knee dropped me in the balls. The night of the Rainier Park beating I slept with a cold pack on the left side of my face and dreamed I lived in a museum diorama with the Hottentot Venus and Ishi, last of the Yahi. Surrounded by stuffed mastodons and saber-toothed tigers, we played dominoes on a small round table in front of a hastily oil-painted backdrop of the Hollywood Hills. All the dominoes were blank, and inexplicably I spent long periods of time considering my next play. Ish and Hottie would scream at me in Z-Talk to hurry up. Plize dizza fizzucking dizaminos. As I pulled dominoes from the pile, I tried to explain that it wasn't a matter of playing a blank domino, it was a matter of playing the right blank domino. Dizum bizastard. At feeding time the caretaker would give me a pack of Oreos and the visitors would yell, cannibal, and throw their yellow metal visitor buttons at me. The buttons turned to snow as they passed through the glass partition. I woke up comfortable in the knowledge that I was a freak. If I had walked the streets with a carnival barker to promote my one-boy sideshow, I could have made some money. Hurry. Hurry. Step right up. All the way from the drifting sands of whitest Santa Monica, the whitest Negro in captivity, Gunnar the Persnickety Zulu. He says, whom, plays Parcheesi, and folks, you won't believe it, but he has absolutely no s whatsoever. My inability to walk the walk or talk the talk led to a series of almost daily drubbings. In a world where body and spoken language were currency, I was broke as hell. Corporeally mute, I couldn't saunter or bojangle my limbs with rubbery nonchalance. I stiffly parade marched around town with an embalmed soul, a rheumatic heart, and Frankenstein's autonomic nervous system. Puberty wasn't supposed to be like this. The textbook said something about a little acne, some chest hair, and that I could use this special time in life to grow closer to my parents by discussing my nocturnal emissions with them. Mom. Dad. Six cc's of jizz last night. Am I a man or what? Instead, my adolescence was like going to clown college. I found myself clumsily walking on a set of size 13 feet, 
bumbling through the streets of hillside and ricocheting off inanimate objects and into the pathways of hypertensive and equally embattled pedestrians. I constantly found myself cowering under raised umbrellas and fists, hurriedly apologizing and kowtowing for forgiveness for stepping on someone's heel. I learned the hard way that social norms in Santa Monica were unforgivable breaches of proper hillside etiquette. I'd been taught to look someone in the eye when speaking to them. On the streets of Hillside, even the briefest eye contact wasn't a simple faux pas but an interpersonal trespass that merited retaliation. Spotting a potential comrade, I'd catch his eye with a raised eyebrow that said, Hey, guy, what's up? A glance I hoped would open the lines of communication. These silent greetings were often returned in spades, accompanied by the angry rejoinder, nigger, what the fuck you looking at, and a pimp slap that echoed in my ears for a week. I'd rub my stinging cheek, dumbfounded, and find myself staring into a pair of dark sullen eyes that read, Forboden. Stressed out ghetto child at work. Keep out. The people of Hillside treat society the way society treats them. Strangers and friends are suspect and guilty until proven innocent. Instant camaraderie beyond familial ties doesn't exist. It takes more than wearing the same uniform to be accepted among one's ghetto peers. The German spies in those late-night World War II movies who tried to infiltrate U.S. Army units by memorizing baseball trivia and learning to chew gum with a certain snappy American flair had it easier than I did. I couldn't just roll up on some folks and say, I know the black national anthem, a killer sweet potato pie recipe, and how to double dutch blindfolded. Will you be my nigger? Dues had to be paid, or you wasn't joining the union. I had my overbite corrected and an impacted molar removed when I approached a crew of kids sitting on the fender of a metallic gold 1976 Monte Carlo with white interior. The boys were playing the dozens, snapping on each other's mothers, I walked directly up to the fattest kid, playfully punched him in his dowy shoulder, and said, hey, I don't even know your name, but your mother's so black she sneezes chimney soot and pisses you who. The family dentist said she couldn't have done a better job herself. The hillside tribe wasn't going for no ghetto fakery. If I wanted to come correct, I'd have to complete some unspecified warrior vision quest. The gods of blackness would let me know when I was black enough to be trusted. I walked the dark streets of Hillside with my head down, looking for loose change and signs that would place me on the path to right on soul brother righteousness. In early September, bruised and toothless, I realized that my search for companionship was becoming too painful. Trying to foist myself on these people wasn't going to work, I needed a more transcendental approach to locating my soul. To achieve this soulful enlightenment, I started playing Thoreau in the Montgomery Ward department store over in the La Cienega Mall, turning its desolate sporting goods department into a makeshift Walden. I moved the pond, a flimsy dark blue plastic wading pool decaled with big-eyed, absurdly happy black and yellow ducks, next to the eight-man tent tucked away in the wilds of the camping section. The tent was pitched in a four-tree forest of plastic redwoods and dead nylon leaves in various states of factory decomposition. A phalanx of cuddly foam forest creatures, nay archery targets, roamed the grounds, a white-tailed deer with its nose in a Kodiak bear's ass, and a wild turkey propped against a ping-pong paddle so it wouldn't fall over on its side. A few passes of aerosol mosquito repellent and I had all the scents and sounds of the wild. Ms. Palazzo, you're wanted in shipping. Fun FAFTS for department store campers did you know that you can tell the temperature by counting the number of high-pitched department store dings in a minute, then dividing that number by five? I spent entire days in the tent, snuggled up in a down sleeping bag reading Kant, Hegel, and the Greek tragedies by flashlight. Whenever I felt the need to stretch my legs, I'd break out my Cub Scout compass and go orienteering around the store. Grabbing a fishing pole, I'd blaze trails from the glacier white kitchen appliances up the steep back stairwells and traverse the lawn furniture outback until I reached the bluffs of television sets that overlooked the pet store. From the balcony I'd cast my line into the aquariums below, 
sip a cream soda, and commune with nature, waiting patiently for a bite. The end of a good day's fishing would yield a cooler filled with angelfish, oscars, and tiger barbs, but since I wasn't much of an angler, it was usually guppies, guppies, and more guppies. The day after Labor Day I was sitting in the tent reading Homer when I overheard some voices outside excitedly commenting on the nearby display of hunting rifles and bows and arrows. Ah, intrepid explorers. Cautiously, I peeked my nappy head out from between the tent flaps and saw a group of black and Mexican boys a little older than I assembled in household weaponry. The glass case was broken and most of the guys were peering down the barrels of shotguns. One was passing a sharp bowie knife under the nose of the terrified salesperson and asking if he could slash some prices. If I planned to trade pelts for foodstuffs and form a working relationship with this barbarous bunch, I'd have to try the avuncular approach. I placed both hands in my pockets and sauntered over to the group in as non-threatening a manner as possible. Each kid was dressed from head to toe in various shades of blue. Baby blue baseball caps, navy blue scarfs, and from the back pockets of those loose-fitting midnight blue chinos, dodger blue handkerchiefs bloomed like cottony autumn delphiniums. What did the Venice Beach queer say about dark blue hankies in the right rear pocket, was it dominant or submissive? While I tried to remember, a dwarf-sized freckle-faced big-headed redbone kid the others called Pumpkin knocked an arrow into a powerful compound bow. He took aim at a smug-looking mannequin who was standing up in an aluminum dingy, holding a rod and reel and modeling a black and red checkerboard lumberjack jacket with a matching hat, the kind with wool ear flaps. One of Pumpkin's cronies gently placed an apple on the dummy's head and stepped back. Pumpkin lifted the bow, pulled back on the string till his hand touched his ear, shot an arrow that pierced the mannequin's forehead and exited through the back of his plaster skull, landing somewhere in the young miss section. I shot an arrow into the air, it fell to the earth I know not where, I said by way of introducing myself. The pint-sized William Tell looked in my direction and twisted his hands in some arthritic gesticulation. I interpreted his double-jointed gesture as a sign of welcome and replied in kind with the only high sign I knew. I raised the back of my left hand to my chin and wiggled my fingers, giving him the high sign popularized by Stymie and Alfalfa in the Our Gang comedies. I felt I was speaking a sort of gangland Esperanto, but Pumpkin stiffened, pursed his lips, and scrunched his face in displeasure. To dampen his anger, I commented on the expensive sheepskin quiver strapped across his chest. Nice quiver. Quiver? You saying I'm scared of your ass? No, I'm talking about the holder for arrow shafts. You saying you shaft? Oh, you that cat, that bad mother, shut your mouth, but I'm talking about shaft. Oh, I can dig it, motherfucker. Not knowing what to say next in a game of who's on first that was becoming increasingly hostile, I said nothing and looked longingly back at the tent, but his stare hadn't yet given me permission to go anywhere. Pumpkin and each of his merry men in turn threw up the hand signal again, waiting for me to acknowledge it. I knew better than to give the little rascal high sign again, so I stalled. That thing you do with your hands is awfully cryptic. Damn straight, nigger because I'm a goddamn crip. Where from, punk? Represent, fool, fo, me and my partners break you off something proper like. I felt someone place that apple that had once been on top of the mannequin's head on my head. Pumpkin furrowed his brow, knocked a shiny brass-tipped arrow in his bow, and said, what up, fool? You cuz or blood? My shiftless free will leaned lazily against my brain stem and flipped a coin onto its clammy palm, whistling a chorus of, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a nigger by the toe. From somewhere inside my head a game show host with a majestic voice welcomed me to final jeopardy. What is blood? I answered. The little Lord Fauntleroy's stopped shuffling in place, clenched their teeth, and stood up straight. Their fists knuckled into iron-black ball peens. N, a tall, crazy-looking Mexican boy in the rear said. Wink, tell the boy what he's won as a consolation prize. 
The circle of boys tightened. Okay, Bob. Our contestant has won a matching set of contusions and bruises with possibly some lacerations of his internal organs courtesy of that infamous gang, the, my eyes closed and someone rolled his tongue in a mock drumroll, gun totten, hooligans. The quills of an arrow brushed past my ear and I turned just fast enough to see it plow into the foam head of the deer with its nose nuzzled in the bear's ass. The deer wobbled, then fell on its side, dead. The bear looked relieved and the blows crackled and crunched on my head, rearranging my already lumpy phrenological topography. Steel-toed boots explored the depths of my rib cage and waves of pain rappled up and down my spine. Periodically, my persecutors would rest and step back from my bloodied carcass, share bites of the apple, and admire their handiwork. Yo, Joe, how do you get both eyes to swell with such symmetry and purple robustness? Then they'd swallow, spit the seeds in my general direction, and resume whipping my ass. Between thumpings I remained optimistic, hopeful that this would be the beatdown that certified my worthiness, stamped me with the ghetto seal of approval. Maybe this was one of those jumping-in rituals I'd seen on the PBS documentaries titled Our Youth at Risk or something equally forlorn. My mother would watch these melodramatic shows, angrily addressing the screen. What they talking about? our youth. Those aren't my kids, and if they were, they'd damn sure be at risk. At risk of me putting some euthanasia shotgun pellets in their bellies. I'd never thought that one day I would be in the center of a maelstrom of our youth, pacifying myself with thoughts of possible acceptance into their world. Maybe the gun totten hooligans would beat me senseless, then revive me with dousing buckets of water, welcoming me into the fold with snappy French Foreign Legion kisses on both cheeks and Leo Buscaglia gangster bear hugs. My nigger. What it be like, black. Gimme some love, dog. The secret password would be whispered in my ear, and the sacred soul shake taut. I'd raise off the linoleum floor with swollen lips and a gang affiliation, pumping my fist in the air, screaming to the gods, that's right, motherfuckers, you don't know who you fucking with, I'm down with the gun totten, hooligans. Get back, Jack. Up your milk money before I regulate you and all your punk-ass disciples. I was squirming on the ground, contorted into a bloody fetal mess, too sore even to groan when they rifled my pockets. Finding nothing but the book I had been reading, one of the fistic coterie bemusedly read the title. The Odyssey? Ain't that some club over on Slauson and Normandy? He carelessly flung it back at me, and the book fluttered through the air like a teal-colored paperback butterfly and landed lightly on my chest, face down and open somewhere in the middle. I picked it up, looked at the triumphant, swaggering backs of my conquerors, and read aloud, Athena, gray-eyed goddess, then replied, Take heart, you need not fear such things. But now, in the recess of that beguiling cave, let's set your treasures, there they will be safe. Not the ironic profundity I hoped for, but it portended better times. Junior high started in a week, I couldn't wait. I wondered what the nurse's name would be and if she disinfected cuts and slashes with mercurochrome or the wimpy ouchless spray. I'd have to remember to ask my mother to call the office to ensure they knew how to make butterfly bandages out of those flesh-colored band-aids. 4. I arrived 45 minutes early for my first day of school at Manischewitz Junior High. A tattered and faded U.S. flag snapped solidly in the wind, full of bluster despite bearing only half its original 50 stars. The stars that remained hung on to the blue field by only one or two points. The putrid pink, dirty gray, and filthy baby blue of old glory had seen better days. I opened the steel front door and stepped into the deserted vestibule, looking for some middle school guidance. There was none to be found. No smiling faces welcomed me to the smelting factory of young widgethood. No signs directed me toward fall registration. I walked through the metal detector and went looking for the dean's office to pick up my schedule. Walking through the halls, 
I couldn't keep my eyes off the glossy panorama photographs of Manischewitz graduating classes past that adorned the walls. Class of 23, scads of white students and teachers dressed in pleated flannel skirts and pants. A young colored custodian with a mop in his hand stands next to a metal bucket. The name tag on his overalls reads, Melvin Samuels. A close examination of the principal reveals the outline of a flask in the breast pocket of his suit jacket. Class of 41, other than the smattering of Asian faces lousing up the Anglo-homogeneity, very similar to the previous photograph. A student in the front row holds a sign that reads, Get out of jail soon, Melvin. The wastebaskets miss you. Class of 42, there are only two male teachers, one of whom has his arms wrapped around the waists of two female teachers. The other stands in the middle of the nursing staff, holding a stethoscope and smiling from ear to ear. There are no Asian students. In the years following 1944 the staff gets fatter and there are always three or four black and Chicano faces dotting the photos like grease smudges. Each year's colored faces bear a striking resemblance to those from the previous year. Unless there is a change in sex, it's hard to tell if the minority kids are the progeny of single families passing through the school system or the same kids repeating ninth grade year after year. Class of 67, the first class photo in color. The student population is still overwhelmingly white, but they no longer wear stayed plain white shirts and blouses to school. Instead they sport groovy colorful tartans, stripes, and paisleys. One teacher in the front row is wearing an African dashiki and giving the peace sign. Standing in the back next to a metal bucket and holding a mop is a graying janitor outfitted in a blue jumpsuit. His name tag reads, Melvin Samuels. Class of 68, if it weren't for the same crew-cut gym teacher and bifocaled principal standing like bookends in both photographs, this picture could be a negative of the class of 67's portrait. The faces of these graduating ninth graders are dark and overwhelmingly Latino and black. Mr. Samuels is standing in the back, dressed in a bright orange leisure suit and smoking a cigarette, with a mop slung over his shoulder like a rifle. The teacher with the dashiki has a black eye and his arm in a sling. Class of 86, the last photograph in the series. The number of students in the picture is smaller than ever before. The faces, including those of most of the staff, are Latino and black, with a sprinkling of Asians. A man in gray overalls whose name tag reads, Mr. Samuels, Jr., is standing in the back, mopless and sharing a joint with a couple of kids. Every boy in the front row has his penis sticking out of his buttonfly jeans. Close inspection reveals the outline of a flask in the breast pocket of the principal's suit. The dean's office was just around the corner. The receptionist awoke when he heard the heavy wooden door slam shut. Wiping the sleep from his eyes, he looked up at the clock. Damn, you early. He asked my name and retrieved my schedule from a thick leather binder with Gunnar Kaufman records embossed on it in shiny gold flake. I'd never seen my records. Supposedly filled with my black marks, accolades, test scores, and aptitude results, this fabled folder was preordained to follow me throughout my entire life, passing from school to university to employer to jailer and finally ending in the hands of St. Peter or the devil. You're the first one here. The principal hasn't even arrived yet. Is there some trouble at home? No. The receptionist skimmed my file, using his tie as a reading ruler. He glanced up at me, shook his head, returned his gaze to the file, and spoke. You're not from around here, are you? Nope. Handing me my schedule, he grabbed my wrist and, in the sympathetic voice adults use to raise money for handicapped and troubled kids on late-night television, said, Boy, you know if you find yourself having trouble getting to and from class, the school provides an escort service and you can be placed in protective custody. No thanks, I said. I couldn't stop smiling at the irony. 
The police thought I was a potential criminal mastermind and the school district thought I was an easy target for junior high hit men in training. Seeing that I'd touched a protective nerve, I pointed toward my records and asked the receptionist, in the helpless voice teens use to ask adults for a favor, what's the aptitude part say? I'm not allowed to reveal that without state and parental consent. Come on, man. Be cool. I won't tell. You can trust me. Look, I'm the first kid in school on the first day of school, is there anything less intimidating than that? He opened the eternal dossier, placed his glittery synthetic tie on the page, and started reading. Okay, it says, despite his race, subject possesses remarkable intelligence and excellent reasoning and analytical skills. His superb yet raw athletic ability exceeds even the heightened expectations normally accorded those of his ethnicity. Family background is exemplary, and with the proper patriotic encouragement Gunnar Kaufman will make an excellent undercover CIA agent. At a young age he already shows a proclivity for making friends with domestic subversives and betraying them at the drop of a hat. Satisfied, 007? Your homeroom is on the first floor of the science building, next to the vineyard. You'll see a sign saying Vitus Vinifera on your left. Amazed at what the government can glean from a few time tests and laps around the track, I slunk to homeroom imagining I was wearing dark glasses and a trench coat. The halls began to fill with Manischewitz Jr. High's administrative and security personnel, and my best espionage moves served me well. Pressing my back against the walls and peeking coolly around corners, I managed to avoid detection and made it to homeroom 20 minutes early. I opened the door slowly, index fingers loaded and ready to blast holes into any purveyors of injustice not taken in by my stealth. To my disappointment, there were no enemy agents wearing headsets and minding computer consoles. Homeroom was an antiseptic classroom buzzing not with hostile anti-imperialist activity but with humming overhead fluorescent lights. A pair of dingy felt banners hung at both ends of the room. The purple on gold one at the back of the room read, Caribuni. Bienvenidos. Welcome. Its obverse gold on purple cousin at the front read, Conceive it believe it achieve it imagina. Cree. Rayliza. I took the middle seat in the middle row. The desk looked like a modern Rosetta Stone, etched with penknifed legacies that begged to be deciphered. Kathleen Y. Flacco para siempre con alma Pythagoras the congruent truant, a 2 plus b2 equals c square punk busters get killed. Eventually the hallways stopped echoing with the footsteps of the Oxford wingtipped and high-heeled administration. In their place was the sound of brand new sneakers squeaking on the waxed floors and the heavy clomp of unlaced hiking boots. The walkie-talkie communiques were soon drowned out by the FM stereo metabase of the Barrio Brothers morning show on KTTS. Steadily, the students entered the classroom and slid into the empty seats around me. First to arrive were the marsupial mamas boys and girls. These sheltered kids had spent the entire summer sequestered indoors by overprotective parents. They entered the classroom with pale complexions and squinting like possums to adjust their eyes to the light. The reformed and borderline students followed. They crept into class, carefully trying to avoid last year's repercussive behaviors, and sat upright at their desks, face front and hands folded, mumbling their September resolutions to themselves. This year will be different. I will do my homework. I will not slap Mr. Ellsworth when he calls me a loser. I will only bring my gun to school. I admired the determination they showed in ignoring their corruptive friends, standing in the doorway and egging them on to join the excursion to McDonald's for breakfast McMuffins, orange juice, and a joint. Two minutes before nine o'clock signaled the grand entrance of the Fly Guys and Starlets. Dressed in designer silk suits and dresses, accessorized in askets, feather boas, and gold, the aloof adolescent pimps and dispassionate divas strolled into homeroom smoking tipperillos and with a retinue of admirers who carried their books and pulled chairs from desks with maitre d' suaveness. I'd never been in a room full of black people unrelated to me before, 
and as the classroom filled, the growing din was unlike anything I'd ever heard. I sat like a tiny bubble in a boiling cauldron of teenage blackness, wondering where all the heat came from. Kids popped up out of their chairs to shout, whispered, tugged at each other. Homeroom was a raucous orchestral concerto conducted by some unseen maestro. In the middle of this unadulterated realness I realized I was a cultural alloy, tin, hearted whiteness wrapped in black and copper plating. As my classmates yelled out their schedules and passed contraband across the room, I couldn't classify anyone by dress or behavior. The boisterous were just as likely to be in the academically enriched classes as the silent. The clothes horses stood as much chance of being on a remedial track as the bummy kids with brown bag lunches. Many kids, no matter how well dressed, didn't have notebooks. At exactly nine o'clock the bell rang and Ms. Schaefer stormed into the room. Disheveled and visibly nervous, she never bothered to introduce herself or say good morning. She wrote her name on the board in shaky, wavering strokes and took attendance. The class instantly interpreted her behavior as a display of lack of trust and concern. That day I learned my second ghetto lesson, never let on that you don't trust someone. Even if that person has bad intentions toward you, he will take offense at your lack of trust. Ms. Schaefer spat off the names like salted peanut shells. Wardell Adams. Here. Varnell Alvarez. A key. Pelmel Atkinson. Presentment. Praise the Lord Benson. Yupper. Lakeisha Caldwell. What? Aisha Dunwitty. Who wants to know? Chocolate Fondue Edgerton. That's my name, ask me again and you'll be walking with a cane. I don't know how to pronounce the next one. You pronounce it like it sounds, bitch. Maritza Shakalima Esperanza the goddess Tlazo Tiatliladayo. So you're here. Do crack pipes get hot? Then the gangsters trickled in, ten minutes late, tattooed and feisty. Say man, woman, teacher, whatever you call yourself. You had better mark hope to die Ranford aka Pythagoras here and in the house. Nobody better be sitting at my desk. I had the shit last year and I want it back for good luck. Mr. Pythagoras, take any available seat for now, okay? Who's that with you? Why you ask him I can speak for my damn self. This is Velma the ludicrous mistress triple bitch of mischief Vinson. Ms. Schaefer's unfazed approach to maintaining classroom comportment didn't last long. By the end of the year we called her Ms. Sally Ride, because she was always blowing up at us. After growing accustomed to police officers pulling students out of class for impromptu interrogations, bomb scares, and locker searches, I started to make friends, mostly with the nerdier students. We'd meet after school at the designated neighborhood safe houses on the Ghetto Geeks Underground Railroad, the library, the fire station's milk and cookie open houses. The safest place was the basement of the Canaan Church of Christ Almighty God Our Savior Ubechia Incorporated pretending to be engrossed in Bible study, we traded shareware porn samplers downloaded onto our home computers. The computer was the only place where we had true freedom of assembly. Electronic mail allowed us shut, in sissies to talk our Dorkian language uncensored by bullies who shoved paper towels soaked in urine down our throats and teachers who awoke from their catnaps only long enough to tell us to shut up. I tried to appreciate Spock's draconian logic, Asimov's automaton utopias, and the metaphysical excitement of fighting undead ghouls and hobgoblins in Dungeons and Dragons, but to me Star Trek was little more than the Federalist Papers with warp drives and phasers. Set democracy on stun. One alien, one vote. I was cooler than this, I had to be, I just didn't know how to show my latent hipness to the world. The change in semesters brought new electives and a chance to make new friends. All the exciting choices, like print and electric and wine, making shop, were gang member bastions and closed to insouciant seventh graders such as myself. 
During spring registration I stood in line behind slow-eyed bangers and listened to kind liberal guidance counselors derail their dreams. Buster, I know you want to take graphic design, but I'm placing you in metal shop. Mr. Buck Smith will know how to handle you, and it'll be a good prerequisite for license plate pressing. You've got to plan for the future, Buster, old boy. Can't be too short-sighted, Mr. Brown. Remember, the longest jail sentence starts with one day. I was left with a pitiable choice between sycophant havens, home economics too and drama. A memory of last semester's beginning home EC, where Lizard Higgins's contorted, charred, and smoldering body was lifted into the ambulance and then sped toward the burn unit, was fresh in my mind. Drunk from sneaking sips of cooking sherry behind Ms. Giggscombe's back, Lizard spilled some libations on his clothes and absently leaned too close to his peach flambe assignment. Using his alcohol-soaked Washington Redskins football jersey as kindling, the fire crept up Lizard's torso and enveloped him in an eerie blue flame. Ms. Kramer, the science teacher, said it was the kirsch and sliv of its distillates that accounted for the blue flame. In a panic, Lizard ran, somersaulted, and cartwheeled down the hall, desperately trying to extinguish his blazing body by trying to drop, roll, and cover all at the same time. Ms. Giggscombe extinguished him with a flying body tackle and an old army blanket. I showed up for drama with a blithesome smile on my face and greeted my computer geek friends with cheery hellos and Shakespearean, how now, nuncles. The citywide Shakespearean soliloquy championship was in two weeks. Our teacher, Ms. Cantrell, determined to show that her impoverished Negro thespians could compete with kids at the well-funded Oceanfront and Valley schools, entered us and notified the media that her domesticated niggers would soon be on parade. In a predictable attempt to inject some cultural relevance, she decided to do Othello and assigned parts by having the class draw roles from a hat. There weren't enough characters to go around, so each monologue would be learned by two students. The girls drew from a church bonnet and the boys from a bowler. Gretchen and Ursula, the bespectacled stone foxes of dweebdom, each drew Desdemona and pleaded with Ms. Cantrell to cast me in the lead role as the noble but paranoid Blackamoor. Thankfully, Osiris, god of shy little black boys, fated me to play Iago, the scheming Venetian puppeteer, sparing me from having to place any necromantic kisses on Gretchen's or Ursula's cheek. My dramatic confrere was Nicholas Scobie, a thuggish boy who sat in the back of the class, ears sealed in a pair of top-of-the-line Sennheiser stereo headphones and each of his twiggish limbs parked in a chair of its own. Rocking back and forth in his seat and seemingly oblivious to Ms. Cantrell and life's lesson plan, Nicholas Scobie seemed like an autistic hoodlum. His pea head lolled precariously on his wiry neck like a gyroscope, he snapped his fingers in some haphazard pattern and muttered to himself in a beatnik word salad gibberish. Dig it. This nigger's tonality is wow. Like hep. Like hepnotic. It's contrapuntal glissando phraseology to bopnetic postmodernism. Blow, man, blow. Crazy. Much to the dismay of those who paid attention to the burned, out teachers, Scobie was a straight-A student. Ms. Cantrell divided the class into study groups. I reluctantly approached my partner, his eyes closed, a stream of guttural pablum escaping from his mouth accompanied by a barrage of spittle, bleat ee -e to eat rent dit dit dent ting ting. Send me, Jackson, send me. Oop papada. Tapping Nicholas on the shoulder. I interrupted. Hey man, what you listening to? Apparently able to read lips, he arched his eyebrows to the highest regions of his forehead and answered, Cannonball Adderley. Who? Jazz, daddy-o, jazz. Then carefully removing his headphones, he continued, his pallid ears clashing with his brown veneer skin. You don't listen to jazz? The only truly American art form other than the sit, com. I listen to jazz. David Sanborn, Aldi Miala, and Spyro Gyra. Jeff Lorber is funky. Funky? Fool, 
That ain't jazz any more than Al Jolson and Pat Boone is soul. That shit is fusion. A superficial fusion at that. A little black style with weepy bland white sedative sensibilities. White boys with the blues tinged with some Caribbean high-end percussiveness. So what should I listen to? Do like me, start at the beginning. With what, the New Orleans Rhythm Jazz Kings? No fool, with A. My plan is to listen to everything recorded before 1975 in alphabetical order. No white band leaders, sidemen cool. No faux African back to the bush bullshit recorded post, 1965. Though I'm going to have to make an exception for Anita O'Day, she could pipe. What's your name, cuz? Gunner. Gunner Kaufman. You dark as fuck for someone with Teutonic blood. Nah, strictly Negro hemoglobins. Nicholas introduced himself with a grin. Nicholas Scobie. I know. Do I have a cool ass name or what? Sounds like I'm on some old secret agent cloak and dagger type shit. I should get a card to hand out to motherfuckers, Nick Scobie, espionage. You wanna learn the monologue together? Wouldn't it be cool to be the most famous spy in the world? Makes no practical sense, everybody'd know I'm spying on them, but I'd be appealing to the inflated superego of the evildoer. Be a bad motherfucker, CIA needs to get with me. Yeah, nigger, let's get together later this week. Cool. Later. He called me nigger. My euphoria was as palpable as the loud clap of our hands colliding in my first soul shake. My transitional slide into step two was a little stiff, but I made up for it with a loud finger snap as our hands parted. Scobie gently placed his headphones over his ears and I skated away cool, dipped my right shoulder toward the ground, and with some dapper spinal curvature pimp daddied back to my seat. I picked up the mimeographed Shakespearean sonnets Ms. Cantrell had handed out at the start of class, pressed my nose against the damp page, and inhaled the delirium of blue-inked love poems and newfound friendship. I'd have to remember to ask Nicholas Scobie about the blues. I stood up to read. That thou art blamed shall not be thy defect, for slander's mark was ever yet the fair, the ornament of beauty is suspect, a crow that flies in heaven's sweetest air. More erudition, Miss Cantrell said, more erudition. Scobie and I rehearsed in his bedroom while his mom sat in the basement den watching old tapes of her roller derby days at the Shrine Auditorium. The Scobies relocated from Chicago's west side when the Windy City tornadoes traded their star jammer, Belita, Queen Nairobi, Scobie, to the Los Angeles Thunderbirds for Skeets McNeely, Fat Jasper Perkins, and 50 sets of brake pads. During study breaks we'd join her on the couch, munching cheese puffs and directing muffled cheers at the television set. I never understood the game but invariably with time running out and the Thunderbirds down by five points, a plump man in a garish burgundy three-piece suit waved Miss Scobie off the bench. Queen Nairobi skated around the ring in long slow strides to the roar of the small but rambunctious crowd of drunks, kids in tattered t-shirts, and wheelchair-bound senior citizens. Measuring her opposition and plotting her offensive strategy, She'd fasten the chin strap to a shiny yellow helmet that sat on her beach ball sized afro like a plastic yarmulke. Picking up speed in the banked turn, Scobie's mom would extend a skinny arm to Big Dan Party Hardy, who'd whip her into a gauntlet of obese bearded and big titted enemy buffaloes on wheels. Arms cocked at the elbows for combat, she wriggled and scratched her way to hero worship, scoring points by ducking under the legs of the St. Louis Gateways dodging the sucker punches of the Pennsylvania black lung sputums, and sailing over the body blocks of the Bay Area seismics. Skating on one leg, arms flailing like windmills, Miss Scobie was so athletic that she sent the opposition hurtling over the rails and into the ringside seats, where crazed fans pelted them with fistfuls of stale popcorn, cups of flat beer, and metal folding chairs. As Nicholas's mother rolled off the track, bent at hips and unsmiling, the PA announcer would yell, six big T-bird points, 
and the big man in the burgundy suit would greet the winded Queen Nairobi with a kiss. They were oblivious to the flying aluminum walkers and whiskey bottles that zipped past their intertwined bodies, and flashes of sweet pink tongue victory darted from their lips. Nicholas and I returned to our studies. Yo, is that mauve suited kumquat your father? I think so. Mama won't say. They call him Jean, the dream, Beasley. You got any dreams, yo? Yeah, I have a dream. Dream and a half, really. You ever hear of a Brock Inspector? Who? Nicholas put down his monologue. A Brock Inspector. If you stand on real high ground, say Mount Everest, with your back to the sun and look down, you'll see your shadow on top of a fog bank or a cloud. That shadow is a Brock Inspector. Oh snap, your shadow on a cloud? That's cool as hell. But wait, there's more. As an added bonus for those who act early, you get your very own glory. Your own what? Your own glory. As you look down at your shadow, there's a corona around your head. Even if you're standing next to a gang of niggers looking at their own Brock inspectors, you can only see the glory around the shadow of your head. That's deep. Gunnar, do you have any dreams? Nope. But listening to you carry on, I'm working on one now. I once heard about some shit called a flatchenblitz. Yeah. It's lightning in reverse. A flatchenblitz strikes up from the top of a cumulonimbus cloud and ends in clear air. You're a fucking reincarnated Prussian Hun Bohemian. No doubt in my mind, homeboy. The City Shakespearean soliloquy finals were held at Anita Bryant Jr. High in the Valley. First to arrive, Ms. Cantrell's third-period drama class entered the plush auditorium and sat in the back, testing the incredible acoustics with ghetto whoops and urban yodels. Hey yo! All white! Manischewitz Drama Club in the house, y'all! Yo mama mama mama, triple A! We were prepared to do well. We had all memorized our monologues, and our old English diction was popping with sexual innuendo and ABBA rhyme schemes. What we weren't prepared for was the lily-white cocksureness of the students from the valley and the ritzy L.A. County woods, Brentwood, Westwood, and Woodland Hills. The auditorium filled with suburbanites costumed in Renaissance finery. The white kids had metamorphosed from surfers, stoners, and student council members into medieval gold-digging courtesans and horny lords. We picked the wrong day to wear our don't-ask-me-for-shit shirts. The white girls glided onto the stage in towering hairstyles and billowy velvet gowns, and the white boys wore ruffled silk shirts, skin-tight pants, peacock-feathered hats, and pointy suede Robin Hood shoes. It didn't seem to matter much when they flubbed their lines, their parents and housekeepers stood and applauded, and the judges murmured among themselves in low voices and nodded approvingly. Whenever Manischewitz Junior High trundled on stage, our hiking boots clomped between deliveries and our baggy jeans hindered our emotive histrionics. When we stumbled over a line of Shakespearean blather, the judges looked down at their score sheets with self-satisfied smirks, tapped their pencils, and stared at us with bored expressions masquerading as smug impartiality. Paul Robeson was turning over in his grave. By the time Scobie's turn to recite came, we had managed to cultivate an atmosphere of good-natured white liberal pity among the audience. Scobie shakily introduced his monologue, Othello, Act 1, Scene 3. After plotting with Cassio to kill Othello, Iago. Then Nicholas, choking on the patronizing sympathy, began. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse, um. He froze. Gathering his wits, he waved his arm majestically across his chest. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse, fuck. The crowd started cheering him on as if he were one of those kids stricken with cystic fibrosis taking his first baby steps on a telethon at two o'clock in the morning, come on, guy, you can do it. Two white girls, one of whom had just nailed Desdemona minutes earlier, 
boldly strode on stage and massaged Scobie's rock-hard hypertensive shoulders and whispered honey-voiced encouragement in his ear, You can do it, big boy. Nicholas blurted out a spiritless, Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. That died as soon as it left his lips. He slunk off the stage, his face hidden in his hands, his ears ringing with a deafening applause for failing. The defeated Manischewitz Drama Club sank in our seats and drowned under a tidal wave of shame. A booming announcement from the MC jolted the crowd from its collective condescension. Next up, Manischewitz's Gunnar Kaufman as Iago, Othello, Act 2, Scene 1. I sauntered onto the stage and squinted into the spotlight, never feeling more misplaced, more burdenish, amo, niggerish. I found it difficult to breathe. I was growing allergic to the powdery mask of Elizabethan whiteface. I could hear Scobie whimpering in the back as I cleared my throat. I'm junking Iago's envy laden, what a stupid moronic nigger this Othello is speech for a less traditional bit from King Lear, Act 2, Scene 2. Note how the fusion of Goneril's vile lackey Oswald and the loyal Kent's lines give the monologue a self-hating and introspective spin. Gazing directly at the judges, I grabbed my dick and ripped into my makeshift monologue. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, three-suited, hundred, pound, filthy, worsted stocking horse son, one trunk inheriting slave, beggar, nigger. I will beat you into clamorous whining if thou denyest the least syllable of thy addition. I walked off the stage into a stunned auditorium of dazed crash dummies adrift in post-car accident silence. At the top of my voice I yelled, Is everyone all right? Anyone hurt? On the ride home Scobie saved me a seat in the back of the bus. I sat next to him, and like two shock absorbers we bounced up and down in the initial stages of lifelong friendship. Gooner, you a crazy nigger. Yeah, I guess so. Nick, where you be at lunchtime? I be looking for your ass, but I can never find you. Monday meet me at the wine vats near the back gate. When Monday's lunch bell rang I tore out of class and ran to the back gate to meet Scobie. He was already there with nine boys and one girl silently huddled about a tape deck. Those who weren't lacing their sneakers and adjusting sweatbands were whipping a basketball around with a sharp crispness that seemed to singe the hands of whoever was on the receiving end. One boy was pulling on tube sock after tube sock until his feet looked as if they were encased in plaster casts. He winced as he placed his padded feet in a pair of high-top sneakers. I turned to the kid and said, How many pairs of socks do you have on? Seven. Why? For good luck, stupid. Oh, yeah, right. Sure. My bad, I should have known. Nicholas Scobie peeked around the corner of the wine vats and said, Okay, Mr. Yuyashima isn't looking, let's go. The chain link fence groaned and sagged under the weight of ten kids scaling it like boot camp marines. From the other side, Scobie looked back at me with a pained expression. Yo, cuz, the radio. I tossed the radio over and began climbing, catching my pants leg in the barbs at the top of the fence. None of the kids had bothered to wait for me, they were running down Airdrome Avenue, heading for the park. Kaufman. It was Mr. Yuyashima, the dean of boys, yelling and blowing his whistle. He marched toward me, swinging his paddle. I flung myself onto the sidewalk, ripping my pants in the process, and ran after the rest of the gang. I caught up with them at the park. There wasn't much time and they were in a hurry to get started, kissing their talismans and pleading with Nicholas, Scobie, fuck that nigger, let's play. Chill. Nick Scobie turned toward me, whisking the ball behind his back and through his legs and looking me in the eye. Come on, Gooner. It's us five. Me, you, he quickly pointed out three other boys, Dontivius, Snooky, and Spoon. The kid who had painstakingly put on all those socks whined, what about me? That's fucked up. That skinny Mark motherfucker can't even play no ball. 
Look, Patrick, sub for spoon every six baskets. Patrick was right, of course. I'd never played a game of basketball in my life and told Nick so. Nick, I ain't no ball player. I know you ain't. I seen you looking at those sonnets, drool dripping out your mouth. You either a poet or a homosexual. Oh shit, that's fucked up. Why can't I be both? True. Well, you can be a ball player too. If you want to hang with me, you're gonna have to play ball. Alright? Press the play button. I pressed the tape deck's play button and a deep bass line rumbled over the blacktop. The music set the tempo and provided the ballplayers with a groove line around which to improvise. They spun, twisted, lunged, and chased each other from pole to pole as I ran in circles, determined to stay as far away from the ball as possible and still look busy. The Santa Monica School District didn't have a physical education curriculum. Participation in organized sports was looked down on as the taboo dominion of societies underprivileged. During proletarian pastimes week, instead of playing sports we learned the rules. Ms. Sejani had a nephew who was the UCLA basketball team's manager. After he explained to us the intricacies of handing out towels to sweaty giants and the importance of liquid electrolyte replacement, he taught us the game, using two waste paper baskets and a globe. I jogged near the sidelines, trying to recall the nephew's lessons. The other kids ran purposefully up and down the court. Adriana Karras put Scobie on her hip, pump faked, spun left, and smartly banked the ball in the basket. One, double dribble, no dribbling with two hands. Two, foul, touching an opposing player with ball results in a defensive foul. Three, traveling. I remembered the UCLA team manager had had trouble explaining traveling, saying it was a vague rule that was often dependent on the referee's interpretation. Deciding that visual demonstration would best explain the ambiguous violation, Ms. Sejani's nephew grabbed the globe firmly between two hands and ran about the room feigning a dribbling motion. Suddenly he stopped and jumped high in the air without shooting the metallic earth into the trash basket. When he landed he said, if you do that, you've traveled. Perplexed, I asked him, traveled where? The college boy got indignant and tried to bluff his rulebook mastery across. If a player in possession of the ball leaves the playing surface with the ball and lands at a location other than the original takeoff still in possession of the ball and without having dribbled the ball, said player has created an unfair advantage and traveled. Dot. What if you come down in the exact same spot? Then you haven't gained an advantage, you're right back where you started. Impossible. The student manager must have been a physics major, because he jumped up and down a few more times to prove that landing in the same spot was an impossibility. But, what if? Traveling, you little fuck. As the game wore on, I began to notice that whenever anybody on my team rebounded a missed shot, everyone ran at top speed toward our basket. I got cocky and decided to take an active role in the game. I began by playing defense. It looked easy enough, you just stood in front of whoever had the ball and wiggled your body until you exasperated your opponent to the point of distraction. A boy named Weasel Torres dribbled toward me and I leapt out in front of him, placing my lanky frame between him and the basket. Weasel's feints and pivots couldn't shake my unorthodox jumping jack defense, and for good measure I burped in his face, causing Weasel to shoot a wild shot that clanged off the rim like a cannonball. Scobie rebounded and I took off down the court, my speed boosting me ahead of the pack. With a devilish look in his eyes, Scobie fired a bullet pass that hit me right in the hands about 15 feet from our team's basket. I caught the ball, took the one dribble my coordination allowed, then jumped as hard as I could, my eyes closed tight. I could hear Ms. Sejani's testy nephew, you land with the ball, traveling. I must have stopped breathing, because I could feel my legs kicking in midair as if I were suspended from an invisible noose. What the fuck was I doing with a basketball in my hands? 
I opened my eyes and saw that my momentum was hurtling my fragile body toward the basket and the steel rim was closing in on the bridge of my nose. I raised my arms in self-defense and crashed into the basket, the ball slamming through the hoop with an authoritative boom. Instinctively, I grabbed onto the rim to stop myself from flying into the pole. When I slowed to a gentle sway, I let go and dropped to the ground with a soft thud, just as the bell ending the lunch period sounded in the distance. The game stopped. The other players looked at each other, perplexed, for a brief second and then burst out in a frenzy of high-pitched whooping, high-fives, and high-stepping jigs. Oh shit. Yo, that nigger had legs akimbo. Oh shit. Scoby, your boys got like crazy hops. Ain't no 7th grade bailers in the city dunking. This nigger has high-flying kung fu triple feature you killed my teacher you dirty bastard rise. Oh shit. On the walk back to school, Scoby looked at me as if he knew something I didn't. Mr. Yuyashima met us at the gate. He sent the rest of the boys and the lone girl to class. I had a swat coming to me because I had ignored a direct order. As Mr. Yuyashima marched me over to the wine vats for corporal enlightenment, Patrick turned around, cupped his hands to his mouth, and shouted, Yuyashima, don't hit Gunnar too hard, he dunking with two hands nasty like pow. Bent over in the musty shed catching heat with my pants puddled in a denim heap about my ankles and my elbows dug into my knees, I'd received three of the prescribed five swats when Mr. Yuyashima asked me did I really dunk. I said yes and he sent me back to class with a stinging pat on my tender behind. Way to go, he said. Way to go where? I snapped back. I sat in Spanish class, my warm ass simmering in the seat of my pants, trying to concentrate on the infinite conjugations of the verb escribber, scribbled on the board. I thought of Sven Kaufman taking lashes for his farcical dreams of being a dancer and realized I had taken my swats for the sake of friendship. Not for some orchestrated Semper Fi cultish fraternal bonding or a Huck Finn nigger Jim love the one you're with, friendship, but because I'd met a special motherfucker whose companionship was easily worth a middle school beating. Gunnar, has una oration utilizando la palabra escribir, por favor. Yo voy a escribir pomas como Octavio Paz y Kid Frost. Queens? Octavio Paz era un pota gordiflon y activista de Mexico. Y Kid Frost? Les un poet astro hip hop de la vieja guardia, de la vieja escuela queen vivo en Pomona o en la este. Vieja escuela? C. Si, de la old es full. Bueno. Mata a los pinch gringos. No hablo este lingo y yo quiero jugar bingo. Ya estuvo, time to show and provo. Bastante, Gunnar. I spent the next Saturday perched on the front steps, lazily watering the lawn, waiting for a poem to descend from the midday Los Angeles haze. Paying special attention to the dry patches, I slowly turned the front yard into a grassy swamp, forcing the ants and beetles to scramble over one another as they sought higher ground on the aluminum Montgomery Ward fence that surrounded the yard. There was a different vibrancy to 24th Street that day. The decibel level was the same, but a grating Hollywood hullabaloo replaced the normal hillside barking dog and nigger cacophony. The newest rap phenoms, the Stoic Undertakers, were filming a video for their latest album, Closed Casket Eulogies in F Major. Earlier in the day I had wandered into the production tent to audition for a part as an extra. The casting director blew one expanding smoke ring in my direction and dismissed me with a curt, too studious. Next. I told you I want menacing or despondent and you send me these bookworm junior high larvae. Moribond Video Works was on safari through the LA jungle. A caravan of film trucks and RVs lurched through the streets like sheet, metal elephants swaggering through the ghetto Serengeti. Local strong, armed youth bore the director over the crowds in a canopied sedan chair, his seconds shouting out commands through a bullhorn. 
Buana wants to shoot this scene through an orange filter to make it seem like the sun's been stabbed and the heavens are bleeding onto the streets. Special effects, can you make the flames shoot farther out from the barrel of the Uzi? Mr. Edgar Barley Burroughs wants the guns to spit death. More blood. You call this carnage. More blood. My street was a soundstage and its machinations of poverty and neglect were Congo cinema verite. Quiet on the set. Camera. Roll sound. Speed. Action. Carloads of sybaritic rappers and hired concubines cruise down the street in ghetto palanquins, mint condition 1964 Impala lowriders, reciting their lyrics and leaning into the camera with gnarled intimidating scowls. Cut. The curled lips snapped back into watermelon grins like fleshy rubber bands. How was that, Masa? Menacing enough Fogia? You got M pissing their pants in Peoria. Now one more take, and this time make sure they defecate their dungarees in Dubuque. Our local councilman, Pete Hush Money Brocklington, walked past my house wringing his hands and bragging to the passers-by about the loads of money pouring into the neighborhood coffers. I only saw the bulge in his pocket. When the civic carpetbagger ventured into firing range, I pressed my thumb into the nozzle and sprayed him with a water jet from my Montgomery Ward Birmingham special garden hose. He was about to chastise me when my mother, obviously of voting age, opened the screen door. Gooner, stop playing with the hose. Councilman Brocklington waved to her. My mother ignored him and sloshed across the lawn to inspect my job, then joined me on the steps. I looked down at her sopping wet feet, as she wiggled her toes, tiny bubbles squeezed through her canvas sneakers. Mom, I need some new tennis shoes. What's wrong with the ones you have on now? They're damn near new. These are skateboard sneakers. I can't play basketball in these. What, you stopped skateboarding? I played basketball for the first time the other day, and I think I'm gonna be pretty good. Besides, the streets out here are all fucked up, cracks, potholes, broken glass. You can't skate on that. Every time I fall, I get cut to ribbons and my wheels get all thrashed. Well, what kind of shoes do you need? I don't know, something like the ones they advertise on television, I guess. Something expensive, I suppose. Don't people get shot for wearing those shoes? Ma, it's not the shoes, people get shot because someone decides to shoot M. Anyway, I'll get Nick to go with me to the store. Okay. I'll give you the money tomorrow." A member of the film crew yelled, sound, and the beats to the stoic undertaker's latest single, exhume the dearly departed and take their watches, kicked in. Reflexively, my eyes closed halfway, my shoulders hunched toward the ground, my right foot tapped softly on the stair, and my head began a faintly perceptible bob. Your taste in music sure has changed. How can you tell? I thought you were tone deaf. When you used to listen to that rock and roll, your head used to bang so hard I thought it was going to snap off and roll into the street. Now you look like you're strung out on heroin. Your body just teeters from side to side like you have an inner ear infection, reminds me of Gene Kelly in those sailor movies. Gooner, why don't you buy some tap dancing shoes instead? It'll be safer, no one would shoot you for your tap dancing shoes. Gene Kelly, Ma. Tap dance? Vaudeville is dead. You want me to change my name to Bubbles and start singing them, call me shine, songs? No one would have to shoot me, I'd die of shame. Geez, you're sensitive. What topics of importance are these hoodlums singing about, anyway? The spoils of war, I guess. My mother and I stopped to watch lead rapper MC Smarty Pants wave his flamethrower over his head and recite his frenzied verse. Aya hey, uh, yeah, I'm the ghetto Fosfist, inner fighty bla FK Mussolini. The frul druid dousing your DFK in lighter fluid then eating it up like roast weenie. Oh what the foo FK, ketfup, mustard, relish, 
I bar beefway niggers so why embellish the hellish full of hate, fasting my fate with Satan I'm the devil's prime mate. What's with all the homoeroticism? People talk about the white man's penis envy. The white man ain't got nothing on these genital, obsessed hip-hoppers. I know, ma. You should hear the guys at school. Suck my dick, slob on the knob, lick my stick, non-fucking stop. There's this one boy whose nickname is Big Dick Black, and if someone asks him, how big is it, he yells back, three fists and tip. I don't get it. Never mind. I paused. Mama? Hmm. Where do poems come from? Why? You a poet too? Soon as I write a poem I will be. It's corny, but I think poems are echoes of the voices in your head and from your past. Your sisters, your father, your ancestors talking to you and through you. Some of it is primal, some of it is hallucinatory bullshit. That madness those boys rapping ain't nothing but urban folklore. They retelling stories passed down from chicken coop to apartment stoop to Ford coop. Hear that rhyme, boy. Shit, I could get down and rap if I had to. MC Big Mama Osteoporosis in the house. That reminds me, I did the family tree in Ms. Murphy's class last week and everyone believed me. I couldn't believe it. Gooner, what kind of poet do you plan to be? I don't know, the cool tantric type. Shaolin monk style. Lao Tzu, but with rhythm. You'll do the Kaufman legacy proud, I'm sure. The bullhorn crackled, okay, that's a wrap, and the video shoot was over. Hillside's indigenous population stopped clamoring for attention. The Hollywood ethnographers were no longer examining the traditional native dances, and the dancers' hands slowly dropped down to their sides, their rumps stopped shaking. Like photogenic reef-install Nubians watching the white god's helicopter pull away, the hillside denizens watched the film crew coil the cables, load the trucks, and hustle off, leaving us to fight over the blessed remnants of Western civilization they left behind. My tribe wrestled for the rights to broken donuts and oily ham and cheese croissants, then scattered back to our hovels, triumphant from a good day's hunt. Plastic cups clattered in the gutter paper napkins and signed release forms fluttered about the village like lost leaves. It occurred to me that maybe poems are like colds. Maybe I would feel a poem coming on. My chest would grow heavier, my eyes watery, my body temperature would fluctuate, and a ringing in my ears would herald the coming of a timeless verse. Betty and Veronica sashayed up to my front gate, their faces powdered white with donut dust. This time Betty's hair was in two ponytails that stood straight up and then branched off at right angles like antelope antlers. Veronica's flapper-style page boy was dyed silver and sprinkled with blue flakes. Betty slipped a pair of brass knuckles onto her right hand, tossed lightning-fast jabs at the fence post, and started cooing, so Gooner, I know you want to play hide and go get it with us. Ping. The clang of Betty's fist slamming against the fence sounded like a navy radar honing in on an enemy submarine. Ping. Ping. No. Ding. Ping. Ping. Pang. A hook and two jabs followed by a stiff right uppercut put a small dent in the post, and sparks flew off the aluminum. I could smell the tangy scent of charred metal. But I'm the only boy. That's not fair, two against one. Ping. Ping. Bing. Veronica removed a lead blackjack from her back pocket. Look, motherfucker, either you play or I gives you some bruised tattoos. She whipped the satchel at the gate and it gonged against the Montgomery Ward, quality, insignia, sending the fence's lattice into rattling waves. When the aluminum convulsions died down, Betty and Veronica about faced with military abruptness and loudly began to count backward from 100. I clicked my heels and gave the girls one of those casual half-hearted Sieg Heil salutes and hurtled over the fence. I sped down the street like an escaped convict, 
trying not to panic and running through the list of hackneyed movie tricks for outwitting the search party. 96, 95, 94. Rule number one, change your appearance. I zipped through the Willoughby's backyard and ripped a burgundy and gold USC sweatshirt from the clothesline. Their bull mastiff, Thor, began to bark, but I pacified him with a scratch between the ears and a stomach rub. Then it was over the back fence, through the alley, and past the thrift town liquor store. 73, 72, 71. Rule number two, make an effort to disguise your scent. Despite California's water conservation laws and a completely inorganic front yard consisting of a small patch of astroturf, a porcelain turtle, and a plastic pink flamingo, weird Mr. Quigley's sprinklers were on full blast 24 hours a day. I ran under the makeshift waterfall and, soaking wet, made my way around the corner and into the courtyard of the Piccadilly Arms Apartments. 49, 48. Rule number three, convince a member of the local populace that you are worthy of his or her assistance by recounting your tale of false imprisonment and the brutality you've suffered at the hands of the guards. Dexter Sandiford was playing jacks in front of the laundry room, wearing only a pair of loose-fitting white polyester Montgomery Ward briefs. Sitting on his rump, tossing a bright orange ball in the air, and sweeping the jacks into the palm of his chubby little hand, he looked like Cupid. I talked fast. Hey Dex, you waiting for your clothes to dry? Uh-huh. What you on? Sixies. Oh, sixies is tough. Your hands big enough to pick up six jacks scattered from here to Koreatown? Uh-huh. You know Betty and Veronica, them two wild banshees who live on Corning Street in the yellow apartments? Uh-huh. They chasing me. They're going to kill me. Here's two dollars. I'm going to hide in the laundry room. If they come by, don't tell M where I'm at. Okay? Say you see me run through here headed for A.L.'s sandwich shop. My life is in your chubby hands, don't drop it. Uh-huh. Ready or not, here we foam. I slipped into the cramped laundry room. Dexter's clothes were spinning in the dryer. The sound of his size 5 PF flyers caroming around the steel drum drowned out my heavy breathing. Confident that Betty and Veronica would never find me, I stripped down to my soggy size 26 white polyester briefs and tossed my wet clothes in the dryer. Dexter sat outside the door playing jacks and I sat on top of the washing machine playing with my dick. Dexter, you seen Gooner? Damn. Uh-huh. Where is he? He gave me two wet dollar bills and said to tell you he was running over there near A.L.'s sandwich shop. Dexter, tell you what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna take your two dollars out your hand. I'm not gonna tear them dirty drawers off your little pitch black behind, shove the stupid two dollars in the crack of your ass, insert one of them jacks in your wee wee pee hole, and toss you butt naked into the fucking street if you tell me where Gooner is. The silence told me that Dexter was breaching our contract with a cherubic pout and a point of his finger toward the laundry room door. Seeing my scrawny near-nakedness, Betty and Veronica licked their lips and shut the door behind them. Mmm, -mm, tap tap on the fine nigger sitting on top of the washing machine. Veronica cradled my limp body in her arms and placed me gently on the floor. The dryer gave off a strange half-buzzing, half-ringing sound and continued to rumble. Betty's teeth clamped down on my nipples and sucked the chill from the damp concrete out of my body. Warm rivulets of her spit meandered past my abdominal muscles and pooled in my belly button. Veronica crept around my body, teasingly snapping the elastic band on my underwear and grinding her crotch on my thigh, my shin, and begging to tickle her love button with my big toe. At some point during the torturous fury of this menage à trois noir, my undies slid down to my ankles and shackled me into complete submission. The horny furies took tag-team turns squeezing my genitals. Betty's cold hands ran against the grain of my prickly pubic hair, then cupped and kneaded my balls into a shriveled sack of testosterone mush.
Veronica stretched my limp dick with one hand, plucked it like a bass string, and the girls broke into a dueling chorus of gospel double entendre. Veronica opened with, Go down, Moses, way down to Egypt's land, forcing my face between her legs. Betty sidestepped and countered in an Easter Sunday vibrato of, Touch me, Lord Jesus, mmm, with thy hand of mercy, ramming my hand into her crotch. Veronica, reeling from Betty's blows, pointed at my flaccid member and slid into a storefront Pentecostal soprano, Fix it, Lord Jesus, you fixed it for my mother, now fix it for me. Betty reached into my mouth, grabbed my tongue and placed its pointy tip on her knee, and started singing Mahalia Jackson's subliminal hit, Move On Up a Little Higher. Feeling left out, Veronica snatched me by the afro, smothered my lips with kisses, and forced her long tongue down my throat until it tickled my larynx. Betty extracted her spongy plumber's helper from my ear and whispered, Why don't you sing, Gooner? Give your frigid spirit wings and just imagine if niggers could fly. There was a knock on the laundry room door. It was little Dexter's mother come to collect her clothes and wanting to know what all the moaning was about. If y'all in there fucking, you better save some for me. I'll give a motherfucker a shot of life. Just a minute, Miss Sandiford. Rescued at last. As I removed my clothes from the dryer, Betty and Veronica took one last hunk of butt cheek and then started arguing on the appropriate term for a boy's losing his virginity. Deboned. Spit shined. Bitch dipped. I walked home basking in the warmth of newly tumble dried clothes, singing, Oh Happy Day, at the top of my lungs. I was still singing when I got home. A muscle bound shirtless boy of about 16 covered in soap suds was in Ms. Sanchez's driveway, washing the hell out of her Buick La Sabra. He heard me singing and stopped rubbing the caked on bird shit long enough to greet me. What's up? little man. Cooling. The wind blew a cloud bank of suds across his chest, revealing a shiny gold crucifix that seemed embedded in his massive brown torso. It was Ms. Sanchez's son, Juan Julio, known around the neighborhood as Psycho Loco. I'd never seen him before, but knew all about him. His mother used to tell me how Juan Julio's voice was the best missionary religion ever had. On Sundays he'd sing with the choir and his baritone would make the babies stop crying and the deacons start. Ms. Sanchez would hold a crucifix exactly like his up to the sky and swear that drunks, bums, prostitutes, hoodlums, even police officers, people who'd never been in church a day in their lives, would walk into the original First Ethiopa Zatlan Catholic Baptist Church and Casa de Sanctified Holy Rolling Ecumenical Sanctification, kneel at Juan Julio's feet to plead forgiveness, renounce sin, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and put all the money they had in the collection plate. When the service ended, the collection plate would be filled with car keys, crack vials, and stolen credit cards. The neighborhood kids told me the story of Juan Julio's life outside the house of God. On the street the angelic Juan Julio was Psycho Loco, leader of the local gang the Gun Totten Hooligans. I'd heard how as a strong-arm man-child for a lone shark, when he tired of a debtor's sob story on why that week's payments were late, he'd heat his crucifix with a nickel-plated lighter and press the makeshift branding iron into the victim's cheek and scream, now you really have a cross to bear motherfucker. One day I asked Snooky how come his uncle Khalil always wore earmuffs, even in the summer. He told me that his uncle and Psycho Loco got into a tussle over who was going to get to smash the jewelry cases at de Klerk's discount diamonds during a robbery they were planning. Juan Julio grabbed Uncle Khalil by the ears and pulled like he was opening a bag of potato chips. The pop of his ears being snatched off the sides of his head was the last thing Uncle Khalil ever heard. Out of pity, Juan Julio let him break the glass during the robbery, but Snooky's uncle got caught, because he couldn't hear Juan Julio telling him the cops were coming. Here was Psycho Loco, home on parole for killing a paramedic who refused to give his piranha estalino mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation after the fish choked on a family of sea monkeys. What you singing, cuz? Some song. 
that's more than some song. That song got me through four years in the Oliver Twist Institute for Little Wanderers and Wayward Minority Males. I sang that shit from lights on to lights out. Oh happy day, oh happy day, when Jesus washed, when Jesus washed, he washed my sins away. Psycho Loco was still singing and putting a shine on the La Sabra's chrome bumpers when I went inside. It took me eight hours and two boxes of frosted flakes to write my first poem. It was a fitting end to a long day. Negro misappropriation of Greek mythology or, I know niggers that'll key FK her Folza's ass. I lift the smoggy Los Angeles. Death Shroud. Searching for ghetto muses. Anyone seen Calliope? Heard she emigrated to the San Fernando Valley. Fulfills her ranch-styled dreams. With epic afternoon soap operas. And bong water bubble baths. Outside, listening for voices, I hear nothing. The leaves are silent. And the shishi birds look at me. Like I'm crazy. You tell that dime dropper Cleo. She better not. Leave her witness protection program. I seen some stone killers passing her picture. Down by the 7-Eleven. On the sloped banks of the LA River. I sit cross-legged. Classical guru pose, my 50-cent big pen taught with possibilities. Talia's bloated body. Floats by, zigzag gin between firestone radials. Finally catching itself on the rusted barbs. Of a shopping cart. Seriously lost at sea. Euterpe is at the talent show. Begging entrance into the church basement. Permission to sing her Patti LaBelle covers. Promising a big record label she won't. Smoke up the production money like last time. On my knees. I place my ear to the concrete. I hear nothing. No thundering cavalry hooves. Kicking up dust. No war whoops. Not even the ghost town winds of massacre. I have a notion. That if I could translate. The slobbering bellows of Ray Ray. The ubiquitous retarded boys. Swollen tongued incantations. I'd find Melpomene reciting the day's obituaries. Anyone here speak Down syndrome or crack baby? Running my hands over tree bark braille, swashbuckling with palm tree leaves. Nothing, paper cuts and guard, motherfucker. Ham radio signals. SOS APB 911 electronic prayers to the goddess Urania's voicemail go unanswered. Late last night my man picked up a jailhouse phone, yo, nigger, you got to come down and get me out and I was inspired. The next morning I rummaged through the attic and found a can of black spray paint and the stencils my great-great-uncle Wolfgang used to do his Jim Crow handiwork. I painted the poem on the wall that surrounds Hillside. Surprisingly, my still-wet verse didn't look out of place between the specious rest-in-peace calligraphic elegies and the fading Ubermensch graffiti already splashed on the wall. I was eating cereal and watching the Sunday morning TV journalists discussing the prospect of substantive black rule in South Africa when Nick Scobie knocked on the door. He had his headphones on and his arms were filled with a Montgomery Ward trimline steam iron that dripped water, an ironing board, a can of starch, and a pile of brand new white tee shirts. He walked in, propped up the board with a loud squeak, and plugged the iron into a nearby socket. What you listening to? Tashiko Akiyoshi. Who? A piano player. You met Psycho Loco last night, I heard. Yeah, so? Listen to you, yeah, so? Can you imagine the Indians meeting Christopher Columbus and saying, big deal, some midget with syphilis and a bad cold, so fucking what? Pass the buffalo meat? You're Psycho Loco's next door neighbor and he likes you. Likes me how? He likes you. Ever had a murderer like you before? Psycho Loco is going to come over to your house and ask you for favors. Borrow a cup of sugar, hold on to his gun, 
put your sister in a headlock and ask you to kindly tell the police he spent the night at your house playing Scrabble, shit like that. You're involved, Holmes. You're gonna have to respect something more than yourself. You know that saying, fate chooses our relatives, we choose our friends? Malhir E.T. Pity, Canto 1, 1803. Well, here in the street, that shit works in reverse. Fate picks your friends, and you choose your family. Everybody starts out an orphan in this hole. Gunnar, you gonna have to respect Psycho Loco, the neighborhood, and the way things get done here. Psycho Loco and the gun totten hooligans try to kill people. People their perception of fate has slated as the enemy. This ain't Hatfields and McCoys, nobody's birth certificate says Joe Cripp, Sam Pyru, and I definitely don't know no niggers surnamed hooligan, some Irish homies, maybe. If Psycho Loco says you're his friend, there ain't nothing you can do about it. You're friends, cause he says so. Now there might be some fool who lives on the other side of town who thinks you're his archenemy simply because Psycho Loco likes you. That is fate, black. Maybe people with money can skew fate in their favor, but that ain't us. I seen that poem you wrote on the way over here. There was a gang of motherfuckers reading it like a wanted poster. Oh yeah, nigger, 13 years old and you involved now. Scoby ripped open a plastic bag, pulled out a t-shirt, and stretched it over the pointy end of the ironing board. He sprayed the starch over the shirt, licked his finger, pressed it to the bottom of the iron, and listened to the sizzle. Watch, he said. The iron cackled and spit as it glided over the shirt. When Scoby got to one of the factory wrinkles, he pressed the steam button and the iron exhaled plumes of vapor and the wrinkles vanished. After ironing the front and back of the shirt, he snatched it off the end and laid the sleeves on the board. Carefully aligning the hems, he dug the iron into the material, putting a stiletto-sharp crease in each sleeve. Don't put no creases anywhere else. No crease down the back, that's the east side. No military double creases down the front from the collar to the end of the sleeve like them buster-ass niggers from XXY chromosome recidivists. Now go get a pair of pants. I don't care what happens, I will never put a fucking crease in my Levi's. No fucking way, man. I will never be that involved. Scobie laughed and asked if my mother had given me enough money for basketball shoes. I pulled $200 from an envelope marked basketball paraphernalia and fanned the crisp $20 bills, wondering if it was enough to change my fate. 